All right, well, I think we may have more people signing on, but I will go ahead and uh, begin with my opening remarks. So good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council's program with our guest speaker, Dr. Oleg Timofeyev. Thanks to Dr. Timofeyev and to everyone who has joined us online today. I'm Bill Reisinger, Professor of Political Science at the University of Iowa. And I'm treasurer and member of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council Board. I'll be hosting today's program. We're very grateful to our annual donors, members, sponsors, and partners for their support. They include the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program and Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, and City Channel 4, which provides online access to ICFRC's programs along with the U of I Library Archives. ICFRC has adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. We recognize that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of our acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. As we get started, please make sure you know where your video and audio mute and unmute buttons are. We ask you please to keep your audio and video turned off for the duration of the presentation so you do not interrupt the speaker. Following our speaker's presentation at about 1245, we will have a 15 minute Q&A. You will be able to submit your questions via the chat function. At that time, we invite you to turn on your video, but please keep your audio muted to avoid any background noise. If you've been following the news from Ukraine in recent days, you know why today's presentation comes at a remarkable time. Not quite seven months since Russia's military attack on Ukraine. Over the past week, the Ukrainian army has regained control over thousands of square miles of territory in the Kharkiv region, essentially the entire region up to the international border with Russia. Whereas in the summer, the consensus was that the war was, would be a slog, with neither side able to make significant gains. We see now that Ukraine's army has been able to advance rapidly and faces little Russian resistance. These de developments have already caused rumblings inside Russia, with angry arguments among pro Kremlin commentators on state TV channels, and even shockingly calls for our President Putin's resignation being made in public forums, with most of those coming from militant supporters of the war. All this underlines what many thought at the time of the invasion. This is a strategic blunder for Russia, making them less secure than they were previously. NATO is closer, not farther away. Russian military capabilities are reduced in ways that will take decades to rebuild. Europe has decided to wean itself off Russian energy imports, the price of oil and gas has fallen, and more. So how could Putin have made such a major mistake? As much as anything, it was because he does not see Ukraine as a nation, with citizens willing to defend it. But what the last seven months have shown, more than anything, is that Ukrainians are very much a nation whose people have rallied together to resist the Russian invaders. What could be more timely then, but to learn about how this commitment to Ukrainian nationhood was forged. Dr. Oleg Timofeyev is eminently qualified to share his insights on why, as his title says, Ukraine is not a place in between, but a real place. He is a musicologist, guitarist, composer, and documentary film director. He holds an MA in early music performance from the University of Southern California and a PhD from Duke University. He is the world authority on the Russian seven string guitar tradition has recorded and released over 20 solo and ensemble albums to critical acclaim worldwide. His CDs, Music by Princesses at the Court of Catherine the Great, led to his receiving the Noah Greenberg Award from the American Musicological Society for outstanding contributions to historical performing practices. He has received two Fulbright Research and Teaching Fellowships, with the most recent one supporting him to spend 15 months in Kiev. His book on the history of the Russian guitar tradition will be published by Cambridge scholars later this year. He has taught at universities and conservatories in the US, Russia, and Ukraine, including the University of Iowa, where he's an adjunct assistant professor. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Oleg Timofeyev. Well, hello, everybody. Good, good early afternoon, I suppose. Um, I'm wondering about what kind of authority on Ukraine I am since I'm not a historian, not a political scientist. 
um, not a geographer. Uh, so basically what I am is just simply a person with some passion and some uh, interests. And, uh, um, you know, as Dr. Reisinger just mentioned, I spent a year and a half in Ukraine and learned a lot, you know, because I originally am from Moscow. Uh, it was always in the back of my mind that my grandfather and grandmother were from Ukraine. From, they were Jews from Kherson and Nikolaev, cities that we hear about all the time today. Uh, my grandmother, my grandfather was killed in the, you know, in the World War II. Uh, my grandmother uh, always spoke with certain warmth about Ukraine, even though there are such things as pogroms. And so many Jews who escaped at the time of pogroms to, to America, you know, sometimes think about, about Ukrainian and Cossacks very negatively, but, you know, there is much more to this story. Uh, and of course, while living in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, I realized that uh, how much of this imperial uh, garbage I already contained in myself, how much uh, the Soviet upbringing met me, uh, made me kind of look at the world in a very imperial way. So, um, for example, uh, the word Ukraina for those who speak Slavic languages sounds like a Kraina or, um, or periphery. And only, and that's the attitude of many Russians that it's something that out there, it's not, it's not central, it's not important for, the, for our Moscow centered <clears throat> Russian Federation. But, um, uh, but uh, you know, you, you realize, uh, you know, once you start studying this subject that the word Ukraine actually, it, it's true that it was the first um, way to call the country and it was um, etymologically connected to today's word Ukra Ukraine, but it was the Poles, it was at the time of Rzecz Pospolita that this, uh, you know, it's, it wasn't the periphery of, uh, of Russia, it was that of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. In any case, once I returned from my very revealing trips to Ukraine that really changed my world outlook, um, the Dean Porto suggested that I'll teach a course and uh, I asked my Ukrainian friends and got the advice to buy this book and use this book for uh, as a textbook. So I've been teaching, you know, I taught with it several times. You can see that it's very substantial. It's by Paul Magoshe, what a person who probably is of Hungarian descent, but lives in Canada. And this is a very, uh, very fundamental book very thorough and it's really the history of Ukraine you know with all different peoples who lived in the steppes who at some point uh, you know were the population of Ukraine uh, so that's uh, in many places it reads like a novel but it's too big for uh, for a course for a semester and definitely too complicated for instructor and uh, and the students who are not uh, historians and uh, definitely too, too lengthy for today's uh, meeting. So I will just kind of pointillistically bring out a few aspects uh, of this uh, discourse that are particularly close to me. Just let me find. So this is my uh, is real. I have to say that I pretty much copied from uh, Timothy Snyder, who had a very similar, um, very similar uh, presentation at the time of Maidan revolution. Um, this is Ukraine. Uh, you, in gray, you can see the temporary, temporarily occupied territories, including Crimea, but of course they constantly change. Well, you can see how, you know, a place thus situated could be, you know, could get the reputation of a place in between. You know, there is uh, today's Russian Federation, before it was Soviet Union that had the entire territory of Ukraine, uh, Poland, Belarus, and uh, today's Ukraine, and even some parts of Russia at some point were parts of, um, 
Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, parts of, of Ukraine were under control of uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. And of course, there's a very strong presence of the Ottoman Empire in the South. Um, so there are those, you know, especially at the time of Maidan, those, everybody was into geopolitical theories, saying this is NATO's interest, this is, um, this is NATO interest, this is Russia's interest, and uh, somehow talking about this whole political situation and, you know, the uh, revolt and kicking Yanukovych out, all of that was seen as somehow the, the place itself plays no role in, in, the, in the political events. And that's what uh, Timothy Snyder in his presentation that I'm referring to, that's what he was talking, it's a real place. And uh, he really shows that it's a part, organic part of Europe, that it went through, uh, through all the crucial historical processes and he starts with Vikings. And that's where we'll go in a second. Uh, but before I want to say that, uh, you know, since we were not able to digest this whole book, in my uh, seminar, we were particularly, you know, particularly paying attention to the introduction, which in which he uh, Magoshe surveys all the historical attempts to all the attempts to write history of Ukraine, and interestingly, the earliest attempts were in Russia, early nineteenth century, starting with Karamzin, and um, basically Russia could not view it at that time, you know, it considered that Ukraine, that they call Malorossia or small Russia, was a part of the Russian empire. They could not come up with any other narrative uh, than just talking about one of their provinces. So their history of Ukraine was, you know, history of Ukraine as a part of Russia. Um, this is one of those very strange things that, uh, you know, I grew up with, uh, every Soviet child learned at school, how come history of our country starts in Kiev and Rus? Like Kiev and Rus is in the South, uh, and then Moscovia or Russia is the actual country where we live, the center of Soviet Union and so on. Uh, and the, as it turns out, this type of debate is in the middle of the of the this multiplicity, diversity of approaches to to Ukrainian history. So, um, so uh, according to the Russian narrative, all the population of Kiev after the 13th century uh, fall of the city to the Tatar Mongols, uh, the entire population went north and left you know, territory of today's Ukraine completely depopulated. That was pretty much the argument of the Russian historian. Uh, historically next was the Polish historian, okay, who uh, shared something in many had the same uh, fight with the Russians and they were equally oppressed uh, after the fall of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Uh, but uh, again, the memory of this Rzeczpot Polity, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, makes them also think of Ukraine as part of Poland. So it, so it happens with, with empires. And finally, only in the middle of the 19th century, there was uh, the beginning of uh, attempts to write history of um, Ukraine by, by Ukrainian scholars. And the inter not surprisingly, they saw it completely differently. They didn't want to see the unity of all Eastern Slavs. They, they argued for uniqueness of Ukrainian. Pardon me, uniqueness of Ukrainians. And they argued that people didn't depopulate the, you know, the Kiev and the, the population. This was never an empty plate. <laughs> There's really no point and, you know, offered alternative. Is my personal joke about Ukrainian language. You know, if you, most Russians uh, will deny that such langu language exists because the, the languages indeed are pretty close to one another. However, the Russians don't understand Ukrainian. So uh, two problems with the language. First of all, there's no such language. Second, we don't really understand it. Um, it's interesting that there is a saying that language, a language is a dialect with an army. So due to today's 
successes, you know, the Ukrainian army became so strong that, I mean, it's hard to deny that this is a language, I think. So uh, let's start where Snyder started, but uh, I won't follow his route because it's much more focused on history and I'm much more interested in culture and especially musical culture. So the Vikings were there. There's no doubt about it. And even names of the, like the old Prince Oleg, which is my name, it was actually the Viking name Helge and so on. So there's no doubt that the rulers at the time were of, um, of Viking origin. The question is exactly what their role was and how it was actually implemented. So what Magosha writes, uh, both the Novgorod First Chronicle and the pri Primary Chronicle, Povist Vremenich uh, relate the story of the invitation of the Varangians and in various places associate them with the Rus. Consequently, the Varangians are considered to have played a determining role in the establishment of Kievan Rus. Um, I mean, there are different words for Vikings. One word is Viking, the other word is Normans, and yet it's all basically, it all means, it all means the same thing just from different perspectives. So um, the difference between Normanist and non-Normanist theories is not that they believe this, uh, whether this happened. They just want to argue how it happened. When I, the, whatever was written in those chronicles, those basically the people who lived in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, they just couldn't rule themselves and they needed some external power. And so basically they addressed the Vikings so come and rule. And others, not the non, you know, those are the Normanists. And the non-Normanists, especially popular in the, um, uh, in the Soviet Union, you know, because for them, you know, since they considered the roots the beginning of Russia, how come, how come we are, we cannot self-govern, how come we are, you know, passive people, we need some external uh, rulers, so they were fiercely against it. Um, so basically Vikings were like in the early Middle Ages and it was so long ago that uh, we cannot really talk about Viking spirit present in today's soldiers. But it's interesting that this discussion, the discussion of the very origin of uh, Kyiv and Rus um, is kind of relevant in terms of, are we a real nation? Do we need anybody else outside to, to rule us? Um, well, the word that we know very often is, we use quite often is Cossack, but we don't always know what actually it refers to. So, for example, a confusing part for me is that Cossacks are all over Russia, including Ural, uh, Don region. So, how come you know the Ukrainian phenomenon is is so widespread in Russia? Um, we know that the word is uh, probably of Turkic origin, which means wanderer or free man. Um, by the early 16th century, the Cossacks had already grouped into small bands of armed men engaged in trade, especially livestock, furs, slaves, and banditry. So, I mean, it seems like not very, not extremely <laughs> positive description, like what, what kind of banditry. In order to understand what they were doing, we can sort of briefly look at this map that um, from, you know, mid 17th century. Uh, that shows the forces and how the Cossack state, which is in the middle in gray, uh, was uh, between uh, several great powers of the time, Moscovy, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Ottoman Empire, Crimean Hanate, and so on. And uh, basically, uh, the free men or wanderers had to defend themselves. Very soon they became uh, known as some kind of paramilitary or military groups for hire. And uh, that was used in, by Poles and, uh, and by Moscow and basically by every surrounding uh, superpower. Um, that uh, led to a situation in the middle of the century, uh, 17th century, when uh, the 
Hetman, the Cossack leader at the time, Bogdan Khmelnytsky, he had to come up with a with a plan, you know, with which of those powers he should side in order to survive. So he was pushed on all sides, including uh, Crimean Tatar. Uh, he made the wrong choice and he sided with, with Moscow. And this was on the, these legal terms of the 17th century. But my understanding is that signing that decree <clears throat> that made Russia and uh, I mean, Russia that was called Moscow at the time and Ukraine made them uh, allies. I think uh, it was differently understood by the, by the Russians. You know, in Russia, it was celebrated as unification of Russia and Ukraine. I, I, I don't think Khmelnytsky really meant something. Like that. Um, now, if we cannot talk about Vikings as a role model for today Ukrainians, the idea of a Cossack as a free wanderer, free spirited person is extremely strong uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, people dress like Cossacks, have the hairstyles like Cossacks. Uh, it's known that uh, in the Cossack society, the way the questions were decided, you know, were very democratic, where everybody had a voice. And so, there, perhaps Ukrainians um, found the, the source for the ability to self-organize. Because as you know, for example, how this uh, invasion started, um, uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, Zelensky didn't really take warnings from the West. And uh, it seems like it was all set for catastrophe, but somehow Ukrainians self-organized and found a way. So that's, that's would be arguably called the Cossack spirit. Now, uh, the fact that Cossacks were for hire means that uh, they were very much used by, uh, by the Russian royalty to solve the Chechen, I mean, to solve the Chechen problem, so to speak, to use them as the guard in Northern Caucasus, uh, to do all kinds of things, basically, to suppress the uprisings like today Omon in Moscow at the time it was Cossack. So that's why in Russia the word Cossack partially uh, developed a bad reputation. In the meantime, um, perhaps some of you saw um, you know, a clip of uh, Cossacks beating the members of Pussy Riot. So those are paramilitary Russian organizations. They call themselves Cossacks and they have nothing to do <laughs> with, the, with the, you know, Ukrainian Cossacks uh, on the other side of the border. Uh, so very related to Cossacks. Um, is the epic tradition. Uh, because uh, those times, the times of um, Cossack state, you know, 17th um, and centuries and earlier and after, uh, they were, are not particularly well documented on, on paper. And uh, Dumas, the long narratives, long narrative songs, they have, um, uh, they have many functions. I mean, pure literature, of course, but they also could be, serve as uh, some kind of oral history because they usually deal with those situations with the Cossacks at the time that they were having various military issues with the Ottoman Empire. And a very, very uh, common theme is about either Poland Cossack in the war with the Turks or captured by the Turks. So uh, you can use a second to read this quick um, summary of the uh, Ukrainian Duma that we're going to listen to. Uh, unfortunately, we can only listen to because it was, uh, you know, it's very long and in Ukrainian, but okay, I, I, I trust that you already read the summary, so I will stop sharing and start sharing differently. Just a moment. So this was uh, Mykola Budnik, 
uh, one of the pioneers, I mean, this tradition of, uh, you know, long epic ballads was strongly discouraged in Soviet times. And so the, <clears throat> the Kobzari, the people who actually performed it, accompanying themselves on Kobza or Bandura on those plucked instruments, uh, they were always blind. Uh, they were kind of as class, they were slowly but surely, uh, well, I don't want to say killed, but sent to the Gulag and stuff like that. Um, but somebody still uh, was left. And so there were also some recordings, some old recordings like those cylinders. And so Mikola Budnik was the first person who started making, uh, making physically making those instruments, uh, learning this tradition. You know, in the new generation, you don't have to be blind. Uh, so let's see if you can hear it. Uh, the, there are many, many performances of this, um, many performances of this, of this Duma, but this one uh, is good because it has uh, English subtitles. Unfortunately, it only goes halfway. Ой, на чорном мохрі, да на камені білені кому, там стояла темниця кам'яна. А в тій темниці сімсот козаків бідних невольників пробував. Да не Боже світу, не сонця правда одного. Очі ніколи не видали. А до тієї Темниці дівка Бранка Маруся попівна був славка прибувала. Да через залізні ворота до козаків бідних невольників гукала. Гей, козаки бідні і невольники, угадайте, який сьогодні день у нашій землі християнській. Козаки, бідні невольники, та є зачували дівку, бранку, Марусю, попівну, Богославку, по голосу пізнавали. Та до неї словами промовляли. Гей, дівку, бранку, Марусю, попівну, Богославка, від ким ми можемо знати, який сьогодні день у нашій землі християнській. Як ми уже тридцять три роки, як у цій темниці пробуваємо. Да ні Божого світу, ні сонця праведно в очі ніколи не видаємо. Кабранка Маруся попівна був славка та її зачувала. До козаків бідних невольників словами промовляла. Гей, козаки бідні і невольники! У нашій землі християнській сьогодні великодня субота, а завтра буде святий день, великий день. Yeah, unfortunately, this ballad stops here, and we can show you. Sorry, 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 little technical. Take a second. Minute. 
I'm sorry, I'm just looking at this. Okay, can you see my screen now? Um, yes. Well, thank you, sorry. So uh, basically, yeah, I apologize for the technical uh, inconvenience. Uh, so um, just uh, since we cannot really leave this story untold, I will quickly read what and you can also read. They bowed their white faces to the ground and cursed her Marusa, the captive maid. May God give thee, daughter of the priest, neither fortune nor happy fate, since thou it was who told us what they had done in Ukraine. Oi, Cossacks, ye unfortunate captive, swear not, curse me not. When our Turkish Pasha goes to the mosque, uh, then will I come to the dungeon and I will throw wide the door and release you all unfortunate. On the first day of Easter, when the Turkish Pasha went to the mosque, he gave the keys to the captive maid, Marusa Boguslav, her daughter of the priest. She came and freed the captives and said unto them, Oi Cossacks, uh, I say unto you, do what is right, flee to the cities of Ukraine, but I entreat you, pass not by the town of Boguslav. See my mother and father, tell my father not to sell his herds, not to disperse his wealth, not to heap up more money, to free me from captivity because I have become a Turkish woman spoiled in need of Turkish comfort and happy pleasure. So this is uh, rather interesting. Uh, it is um, uh, I mean clearly it is an, an example of a heroic woman who um, who does something extremely risky. There are several strange inconsistencies in this Duma, for example, uh, why should the Pasha, the, the Turkish uh, leader, why should he celebrate Christian holidays? Why, why was he celebrating Easter? <clears throat> but most interesting part of it is that at the end, Marusa Bohuslavka uh, doesn't want to be brought back. I'm, I'm not completely sure what kind of future is waiting for her if she, if she just released 33 uh, Cossacks from the dungeon. But um, but she is she is not suit, I mean she she cannot live in Ukraine anymore. That's a very strange um, very strange uh, turn. And uh, many uh, Ukrainian musicians who are studying this uh, dumas and various other forms of epic tradition in diaspora they particularly relate to that because they. Um, you know, they feel very strong about the past, about the Cossacks, but they, you know, there's a very powerful Ukrainian diaspora in, in Canada, in the United States, and they are not going back. Uh, now, about Ukrainian Jews. Uh, needless to say, this topic kind of spoke to me personally because of my own family history. Uh, and uh, one could, uh, argue why, why talk about Jews, mainly while well, this is such a multi-ethnic uh, entity, Ukraine, there are so many other different nations. Uh, that's definitely true, and it's worth talking about them, but uh, for a variety of reasons, Ukrainian Jews are scattered all over the world, and <clears throat> you find all kinds of people with uh, of Ukrainian Jewish origin. Um, so I for my class, I use this book with the Golden Age Shtetl. Um, what, what is interesting, I mean, I don't know exactly if that works like that in, um, in American English. In uh, Russian, the word shtetl, which is mistechka, is a synonym of something provincial, backwaters, very short-sighted kind of uh, view of the world. So, um, when you say uh, Mistichkovi, you mean like a person without, without wide world outlook. 
<clears throat> and a similar prejudice is probably universal. That shtetl, you know, a little Ukrainian sort of something between a village and a, a, a in a village and a, and a provincial town, uh, is a backwaters, is not particularly educated, is not is nothing special. Um, Yohanan Petrovsky Stern, a person whom I actually personally know, he studies and teaches Judaica, and he's a very a good uh, person to dismantle various myths. One one myth that he worked on was uh, Jews in Russian and uh, I mean pre-revolutionary Russian and Soviet military. And so the, basically the common knowledge was that Jews are not good for the military, they're not particularly physically fit, they, they never show good results. And, so, and basically using archival material in Kiev and very in cities, he just The golden age of shtetl is uh, very interesting because for me personally, it uh, sheds light on uh, kind of the beginning of the Jewish question in Russia. Because uh, in 1795, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth um, came to an end. That's what, that was called the third partition. And that's why when Catherine's Russia, uh, Catherine the Great uh, expanded, and reached the area where in Poland, the, the you know, the former Poland, now there were shtetls. And so basically the, one of the chapters um, in Petrovsky's book is uh, Russia discovers its shtetls. And I think uh, it could be called Russia discovers its Jews because as Petrovsky Stern claims, before that the word Jew for Russians was, um, was just uh, from the Bible, you know, they, they just never actually saw a real Jew. So when I, uh, throughout my, you know, high school and so on education encountered massive anti-Semitism in, uh, in the Russian classic literature from Pushkin to Dostoevsky, uh, you know, now we should kind of re realize that it, for, for them, it was a really new problem, so to speak. They actually, they didn't have this thing forever. Uh, it's relatively new. And uh, here's an example that, to, you know, I see this picture today. I don't know who took it, but I know. Uh, those must be citizens of, or visitors of Israel, you know, at the famous wall, uh, praying for the situation in Ukraine today. Uh, we all know that. Uh, you know, Russia accuses Ukrainians of uh, being the Nazis while their president is Jewish. And it's kind of doesn't really uh, work together very well. Um, okay, uh, so uh, now I would like to quickly visit the issue that we call folklorism. Let me try it just a second. Uh, yeah, folklorism is a recent concept, and it doesn't mean it's an understanding that I'm used to. It doesn't mean simply anything to do with the folklore, but it's just the fact that in you know the means of expressing. Uh, Ukrainian identity are almost always through the folklore. As one of our heroes of the film that we made called Mri Prominula, or Dreams About the Past, uh, one of the characters explains that uh, when the Ukrainian intelligentsia was kind of forging Ukrainian culture in the 19th century, uh, they didn't have uh, urban culture at all in their hands. There were different peoples who lived in Ukraine, Poles, in today's Ukraine, Poles, Jews, etc., who, who actually had access to urban culture. Uh, and therefore the intelligentsia, the new intelligentsia of Ukraine built the entire self-identification on various um, 
various, uh, you know, folk phenomena. So here is a little, uh, a little trailer that we made uh, for, for the film that I made. And uh, even though this particular idea doesn't, is not expressed there, but in this three minutes, you will see some of it. Что касается музыки західної, скажем, бароковой або середньовічної, это настолько чужий для нас пласт. Мы очень хотели инструменты, мы пытались что-то делать, но дело в том, что консерватория не имеет средств, они не покупают инструменты. Это реконструкция Кобзе Остапа Вересая. Тому що Лисенко в кінці 19-го сторіччя описав такий лютнеподібний інструмент. Вважається, що у нас єдинна європейська країна, яка зберігала жива епічна традиція. З Тарасом була цікава дуже історія. Викладачка, яка викладала середньовічний теорію, так би мовити, середньовічної поетики і музики, вона настільки була зачарована тим, що Тарас співає 125 куплетів на пам'ять, що вона сказала, він мусить приїхати сюди і розказати, як він це робить. Корея казацка, ну это как бы такой специфический жанр, я бы сказал. Ну да, это как бы не вполне старинный. Ну, да, да, сказать, что это старинная музыка. А это некоторые реконструкции там, пласта. периода, пласта культуры местной. Вот. Okay, suggest that we stop here. Um, uh, so basically, what uh, what I find rather interesting is that uh, every aspect, uh, every aspect of Ukrainian life, you know, when they appear international, I mean, they, they really uh, use their uh, their uh, folk appearance, folk clothes, folk, uh, you know, everything is based on the folk uh, culture. And just to make the last point, I want to show something completely different. The song, I mean, I just hope that we won't listen forever to, uh, to the advertising. This is basically a song that uh, was uh, originally created uh, still in the time of Bogdan Khmelnytsky in the 17th century. Uh, then it was uh, used by Ukrainian revolutionaries uh, while they were suppressed by the Russians. Uh, it was illegal to sing this song during the Soviet rule. It basically was, you know, the song of Ukrainian uprising. And uh, it became super uh, popular after the, you know, after the 20, uh, February 24th invasion.
Yeah. Um, the performance is rather poor. <laughs> the person doesn't have a very good ear or voice. Um, but um, but uh, it's interesting who the performer is. Anybody recognize him? This is Alexander Usyk, the heavyweight world champion of boxing. So uh, even his appearance, his you know his uh, hairstyle, his uh, shirt, all of that is based on Ukrainian folklore. So those were a few kind of pointillistic uh, observations, you know, not necessarily bound together, and certainly not an attempt to uh, retell you the content of this book. But I highly recommend this book. And by now, there is a newer edition of uh, Paul Magoshin. And, uh, you know, Ukrainian history is probably one of the most interesting histories of the world. So, you know, I think it's something to learn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Oleg. Uh, so now we move to the question and answer portion of our program. Please submit your questions via the chat function at the bottom of your viewing screen. Feel free to turn on your video function now, but please keep yourself muted. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, ICFRC wants to thank its members and donors for their support. If you would like to join ICFRC or make a gift to support our programs, please go to icfrc.org. Thank you. Maybe while we're waiting for questions, Oleg, you can talk a little bit about, uh, during your time in Kiev, um, issues of um, the Russian language and Ukrainian language, um, you know, what the, what the ins and outs of that were that you observed. Well, I mean, I definitely wanted to learn Ukrainian when I went there. It turned out that everybody, you know, the, those characters you saw in, the, in our promotional clip, Wearing really like wearing Ukrainian clothes, they were all so much better in Russian. I had to make few awkward attempts to always switch to Russian. Um, I never experienced discrimination to the Russian speech. I mean, Kiev was pretty much a bilingual city with more Russian spoken. I mean, Lviv is a little different story. There, are, you know, mainly people speak Ukrainian, but everybody. Uh, understands Russian, and uh, if you ask directions in Russian, and you know, experiments were made uh, during the worst times of Maidan uh, when people were asking directions and uh, in Russian, and uh, it was clear that they're from Russia, and they were very politely told where to go. So uh, I saw a nicely bilingual country. The situation has changed a little bit, uh, or maybe not so little because uh, now it becomes, you know, the Russian language became more and more associated with the uh, Russian propaganda, with the Russian TV. And so uh, indeed, you know, those who are listening to Russian media are um, subjects, of, uh, most of the Russian propaganda. And th that sort of motivation for those channels to be closed, that uh, causes a bit of controversy because there is a large population um, of uh, Ukrainians for whom Russian is the native language and they don't even know Ukrainian. Again, it didn't happen like that uh, by itself as a result of many years of oppression. Um, I, in my class, last time I taught it, I brought uh, some of my friends who were arguing for switching to Ukrainian only. And a key one, uh, Yuri Volodarsky, who is a rather well-known uh, literary critic, who actually works in Russian. And for him, language was not a matter of like how to buy coffee, but it's basically his profession. And uh, I mean, their point, should I say their points of view didn't, didn't match. They had completely different idea what should be done with the Russian. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, we're waiting for more questions, please. If you have questions for Oleg, put them in the chat.
so you've stayed in touch with uh, the people you worked with on the uh, on the musical projects. Um, how did things change after uh, 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the uh, the war in in Donbas area? Um, my last visit to Ukraine was actually during Maidan, in the December 2013. I. After that, uh, I haven't gone there. And so uh, our relationship is as cordial as ever. Sometimes I see some of my friends in, uh, you know, abroad, you know, in, in Germany. Um, but um, I think their lives changed quite a bit during this time. I just I wasn't there. Two of my friends died. One, uh, we actually just briefly saw them in the clip. One long-haired multi-instrumentalist uh, he actually was here in um uh in iowa city actually it's a, another story that uh, professor reisinger is the president of our non-profit festival every year in 2015 we decided to dedicate our festival to ukraine and so we brought several ukraine the composer and a very interesting musician danilo persov Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, he died of COVID, but partly because of his own recklessness. And the woman violinist, Angela Zaitsova, uh, was murdered out of jail. Terrible story. Those two events happened like uh, very close to the Russian invasion. And sort of in our personal memory are like some sort of bad signs that led to the catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, yes, we will have concerts. Actually, uh, we will have a festival at the beginning of November. Mr. President, that could be news for you, but basically we will have, a, we will have concerts and they will be dedicated to Ukraine. And we will, I'm not sure we'll be able to bring Ukrainian musicians this time. The way we did it. Um, Do you have anything to say about um, what Americans can be doing to help uh, Ukrainians um, outside of military aid? I mean, not, I don't have any special arrangement with Magosha, but I think to learn more about Ukrainian history would be a nice start, just to, to know more about how much uh, Ukrainians suffered from the Moscovy or from, from, the, from the Russian czars and, and from this, you know, from the Soviet. Uh, to learn about Holodomor, uh, the artificial famine that happened in the 1930s. Uh, so that just to be aware, which is not Americans stronghold. Um, I do think that uh, sending money is a good idea and we had several fundraisings and uh, this is not necessarily going to the military. Uh, it's more, I mean, we were focusing on uh, humanitarian aid. One thing I would rather not do is just send everything to one obvious place like Red Cross, because you never know whether it's going mainly into promotion of the Red Cross. So when we earned quite a bit of money in a fundraising concert uh, in, the, in the spring, I guess, uh, we, um, I really diversified and sent it to various groups. So there was one group actually run by people I knew personally who were collecting a mini bus of uh, medications and just shipping it from Germany to, to Lviv and then distribute it. And that's what we did. Uh, the, the person who played Baroque flute, uh, well, if, if we, uh, if that was a bearded person, most likely it was me uh, 10 years ago. The lute or flute? Oh, flute. Oh, flute. Okay. I don't remember one playing Baroque flute, honestly. Okay. One of the surprises um, was uh, you know, everyone knew that there was a strong sense of Ukrainian 
national identity in the Western uh, portions of the country. Um, but uh, what the invasion seems to have shown is that those feelings were also quite strong in the Eastern areas. Um, and, and I wonder if um, you, you got to um, the Eastern portion of Ukraine while you were staying there, whether you had any sense of that kind of geographic um, changes? Yeah, well, the time that we were there, uh, I, I experienced quite a bit of diversity. We were in Crimea, we were in, uh, I mean, I, as, as a soloist of Donetsk, uh, played with Petrov several times, Odessa. I mean, it's a, it's a variety, you know, it's kind of hard to make a sweeping statement. Yes, it's very different from Lviv. Uh, and Ushgorod, uh, you know, it's not that type of train, uh, but it is, um, you know, it's not the same, say, in Dnipropetrovsk or in Odessa. People have, and they, you know, so there are very different, many different types. Um, you know, like my, the person from Kharkiv who right now is defending uh, his country with machine gun, uh, he usually is the film filmmaker and uh, video documentalist who comes to our festivals every year, Dmitry Lovrenenko. And he summarizes his relationship. Uh, some, I mean, he's a Russian speaking Ukrainian. And he says, we are uh, Russian speaking, but we will keep it for our Ukrainian language. So in, those who do, you know, who are against our language. So uh, there are many different ways of being a patriot, I would say. In Odessa, for example, which is completely Russian speaking city, uh, you have multiplicity of uh, various ethnic groups, you know, Greeks, Jews, of course, Armenians, etc. Uh, Russian domination not to say that there are, you know, the, they're the only one. No, there are always those who, first of all, listen to Russian propaganda. So a friend of mine told me that they were in Severodonetsk. Oh, Yeg, your audio has faded out a little bit. We're, we're not hearing you well. Uh, even now? That's better. I don't know what what it is. Um, so he's, uh, you know, he basically immigrated from Severodonetsk to Dnipr, Dnipr. and um, and his mother until recently was a pro-Putin kind of person because she was listening to Russian propaganda. Uh, when it became illegal, she got a satellite dish and listened through that. When they moved to New York, so basically, it's an interesting cognitive dissonance. You're being bombed right now, and at the same time, you're believing that they came to liberate you. Not clear from what. And then uh, she, then they all moved to Dnipro. You know, there's no satellite dish. They didn't <laughs> bring it along. And this, you know, Russian zombification slowly fades out. Very interesting. Yeah, so the, the powerful uh, powerful media effects there. All right, do we, are, do we have any other further questions? All right, if there are not, then we'll conclude our program. Uh, thanks very much to Dr. Oleg Timofeyev for his excellent presentation and for sharing his expertise with, expertise with us today. Uh, Oleg, I'm going to uh, virtually present you with ICFRC's highly coveted mug uh, for coffee, tea, or the beverage of your choice, and we will coordinate delivery details with you very soon. Uh, our next program is on Tuesday, September 20th, uh, also at noon via Zoom. Uh, it will feature Dr. Robert Asadi, who will speak about post-revolutionary Iran. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We are adjourned. Thank you.